Hey guys, welcome back to the Lou Perez Podcast. My name is Lou Perez. If you want to support the podcast, please head over to theluperez.locals.com and join the Lou Perez community on Locals. You get to listen early to the new podcast episodes. And also, I have a bunch of new sketch is coming out, new sketch comedy coming out that I'm really excited about. So if you join the Locals community, you get to watch those a little early as well. I'm uh, so happy to have our next guest on i've been a, a fan of of hers uh for for a little while and i've also had the the uh, great honor of working with her both at uh live uh stand-up shows as well as on video uh so please welcome chrissy mayer hello lou you were the like the very first like libertarian stand-up comic i've ever met like the decidedly you know when i was like just a wee a wee loss you know sort of treading the waters of like what it means to even begin to identify as libertarian i remember yours was a name that like kept coming up people bringing up like oh you gotta you gotta work with lou lou's great and then i saw you perform i was like blown away you're so great um i think we did a libertarian theme did we do a libertarian themed comedy show was it in beacon new york oh yeah yeah we did well and before that we did a um uh, i think it was like a campaign stop for uh larry sharp oh my god yeah it was, a, it was ah, that was such a challenge like i had never done anything even a little bit like political performing wise i was like how do i talk to these people it was like we were in the back of a bar and it was like, you know, everyone was rallying for Larry Sharp, who's great, who's actually like come to be like a friend over the last few years. And uh, so it was cool. And like, I remember there was a show like uh, where they were like, oh, can you like, you know, just ask for donations. And I was like, just ask for donations. Like, I've never done that. That's really scary. Like, I don't <laughs> even I don't have the self-esteem for that. I don't have the confidence. So like I learned a lot. And I, already, at the I, end I mean, of the day, I have a tough time doing that even with the stuff that I'm doing now, like asking people, Hey, could you guys give me money? Like, could, could you like, you Oh, know, for your show or just, yeah, in yeah. just outside on the street, just outside on the street. Yeah. yeah. I, need, I need a new bit for the outside uh, being outside to, of the street. You need to wear like, like terrible shoes. You know, people always look at that. Yeah. Don't ever have nicer clothes right. <laughs> than the people that you're panhandling. No. Well, so, well, something that I, that I, that I really uh, appreciated about, about you, like not only um, not only the material that you do in live stand up, but you also have like a really great presence in that, like Aww. you you wear like very nice dresses and stuff. Except and for today, <laughs> this is literally a shirt that I've painted in. Uh, not I haven't even recently painted in this shirt. It's just like an old, like yeah, it it's make it does make me feel guilty hearing people like, well, I used to dress up really nice because like. <laughs> when it was it was like an event and it was also like i felt like i had this sort of like stage persona mm -hmm. i mean like she's always there deep down but like i even did a show like a couple days ago where i did fully get dressed up again to do stand up at a strip club in hackensack like there was a tent behind the strip club that there was a comedy show in, and i was like fully dressed and i'm like this just feels i just feel overdressed for this situation <laughs> and there's like girls walking by like with their ass hanging out like they're just on their way to work like some of them were in scrubs like just like the most like yep just another day at the old strip club well i think i think with comedy we're I think we're kind of far, so far removed from like uh, the old timey, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, Vegas casino performers where people are, you know, wearing, you know, tuxedos up on stage or, or wearing, uh, wearing dresses where now it's basically, Hey, whatever you want to wear, you wear. So, so I, I appreciated, you know, what you were wearing, but also it added this element too, where it's like, uh, very put together, very professional, and then talking about some of the dirtiest shit. <laughs> yeah. it, it was a really great, you know, juxtaposition you know, that I like. Thanks. Yeah, I was like, I forget who said it, but there's this quote where it's like, dressing up is good manners. And I do feel that way. Like, I feel like if people like c come out to a show, it's like you're already, and I'm, this is speaking like before times, like if you're at a comedy show, it's like, that's an amazing thing to begin with because you're competing with so many other ways to choose to spend your time. Like there used to be live sports. There used to be concerts. Like there's so much competition 
for live comedy shows. So like, I feel like it's my way of being like, Hey, like, first of all, thanks for coming. You're at a show. It helps me get in the mood. It helps me get into like my stand up persona. And I have more fun. I mean, I, I have more fun when I like, look like when I look better, I feel better. It's like this whole cyclical thing. And I think that's been like a big thing uh, that people don't realize it's been going on for like the last year. It's like the, it's like this, what's the point? What's the point of getting dressed? What's the point of putting on pants? Like how many of us listening haven't put on real pants, you know, for months. And then you put on the real pants and like, Oh wow. The real pants don't fit anymore. Okay. (laughs) Time to time to jack up the home workouts. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, I I think it's important. Like, yeah. Anybody listening just like, even if it's something really small, like get, just do your hair one day or just like put on makeup one day, or just like, you know, that those things I feel like really help your like, I don't know, mind body connection. Yeah. So, so you, um, at the, the show that you, you did in Jersey at at a strip club. Um, so what is it like now performing live? Uh, you know, what sort of, uh, venues are open and, and doing it and, and also maybe we could just talk about the reality of performing at a strip club. Like are, are strippers do, still doing like lap dances and is that legal? Yeah. You know, oh, I've, cool. I had talked to a few of my like porn star friends who would do feature dancing. Like I've been talking to them over the last year be like, what's going on. And like every so months I talk to somebody and they're like, ah, oh, well, we're having like, you know, it's, you know, you got to do a socially distant lap dance. I'm like, what does it even look like? Right. You know? And so now things have like, people are less a lot of people are less scared so at the at the strip club comedy show like you know it's it's weird and and even places that enforce masks are like enforce them sometimes and sometimes don't so it's like it's just so funny the idea that you can get a lap dance from somebody like you can get your coochie like all over a person but like gotta make sure you got a mask on you know so i would right. see but they were like you know and i like I've done two shows at this place in Hackensack. It's called Flamingos. And both times I was there, I never saw girls dancing. They're literally just like walking around in their underwear. And then there's just like fully clothed dudes around. So, and they've just got like dollar bills, like in the, in their thong, like you do at a strip club. I just was <laughs> like, I've yet to see any actual dancing. I've yet to see anybody in the cage, you know, showing their stuff. So I was like, Oh, this looks pretty easy. Maybe I can do this. Um, but to answer your question, like how have shows been, really it started um i think like over the summer definitely like spring like i know stand up new york was doing park shows through the spring and summer which they are one of the few clubs in new york city that i think was actually like fighting to keep comedy going i think them and the stand were also doing a really good job of it and uh yeah, of course, like that comes down to like, what kind of people are running these clubs, you know, and like, are they scared of, are, are they scared of the coup or are they kind of see the truth about it? So uh, that was good to see. But in addition to that, like we had some, you know, kind of backyard shows going on, fans of compound media um, would offer up their backyard or like, Hey, I know this abandoned tennis court that we could perform in. <laughs> like I, there were some shows at a golf course out here in Westchester somewhere, like not like in the golf, not like on the green, but like, you know, attached to like the deck of like the, uh, whatever, like clubhouse or something. So people have been trying, you know, like there, there's, there's definitely no, there's not like you know there have been people who have been willing to really like help and i think people who use the last year and the lockdowns and as an excuse like well you know comedy's really hard right now it's like well you haven't been trying very hard enough because Mm. you can find spots you can like yeah it's a pain in the ass places places are not paying as much as they used to or you know a lot of comics have realized like oh hey i'm open to doing shows that i was never open to doing before but it's a thing it's like it's it's there for you if you want it bad enough. Like I normally wouldn't be like, yeah, let me, let me drive uh, two hours to hack and sack to do, to do like a free show at a strip club. But I was like, I need to get, I need to get some reps in. And I'm also doing a show this Saturday at, uh, in Costco, this new room opened up. I think it's like a, it's called the St. Lawrence society. It's kind of, I imagine it's like an Elks lodge or just a place where like grown men go to flee that from their wives. You know, I feel like it's going to be, it's going to smell away <laughs> in there. You know what I mean? Like old leather books. I don't know, cigars maybe, um, but happy to do that. So that's this Saturday. If you guys want to come myself, Karen Feehan, Joe DeVito, Larry oh, nice. Bea, 
Um, I think that might be it. Yeah. So that's all those tickets are on Eventbrite. Cause in, and then, uh, that's a spot I'm doing to kind of get ready. I'm going to Dallas, uh, God, in like a couple of weeks now. So I'll be performing at hyenas in Dallas, February 19th and 20th. And then comedians of the compound is, uh, starting to pick up a little bit more which is exciting so we'll be in Royersford Pennsylvania on February 26th and then I'll be headlining the stress factory in New Brunswick New Jersey on February 28th and that uh, show on the 28th I think also has an option to view it online like you could uh, pay, pay us like whatever amount to, to like watch a streaming version of it which I know some that's what's cool too. Like that's another option now that some clubs are providing. Like if you really are afraid to leave your house or something. Yeah. You, be around people. You, you brought up a uh, hyenas and actually um, I think hyenas was the, was, was hyenas, hyenas I think was the second to last show that I performed in oh, wow. last year. So like uh, last February. So I think it's, I mean, yeah, it's been like um, almost a year since I've, uh, since I've performed live oh and and that was that was definitely a, a fun show. I it was um, I was promoting a a mini documentary, so it was like a screening, and then I got to uh, share the stage with uh, Michael Malice and and have oh uh, my god, which was, I love was Malice, uh, yeah, it was it was fun. But I think you really you really nailed it. Where you know I have so many people who will you know so many people who quote unquote you know call themselves comedians that will look for any excuse on why they're not doing well, and then. You know, on top of, uh, you know, being a hilarious comedian, I think uh, I really look up to you when it comes to your grind. And Aww. like, you're really, I mean, you're a grinder, you're a very hard worker. And I think it's, uh, it, I think over the course of this year has definitely been been uh, paying off. And that that's great to see. Oh, thanks, Lou. Yeah, I definitely had a few months in the beginning where I was like depressed and like kind of, I was waiting to see and then in May I just like might have been I think it was also like through talking uh with like Frank my boyfriend like I had been doing this podcast it was like maybe once a week I think I started the last January because I went to AVN awards in Vegas and I had never interviewed anybody before but I brought like my ring light my I was doing them all from my phone you know like just set it up like uh with a little like what's it called? Yeah. The ring light, like held your phone. And I was like, I guess I'm just going to start doing interviews. See how it goes. Like I got a press pass. I was like, I'll just do this now. And then like, <laughs> and then, uh, in may I was like, you know what, like, I'm going to get, I'm going to get this going again. And I'm, let me try and see if I can do four times a week. Like why the hell not? Like, let's just push myself and try to, and it's scary when you commit to something. Like I think a lot of creative people are afraid to like make a make a commitment because it's like oh well what if I don't keep it up but then I look mm -hmm. like a flake then I look like a quitter or what if I do it and it's not good well now I'm a person who does a shitty podcast so I had like I feel like a lot of people you have to jump over a lot of like emotional hurdles to be like you know what we're just gonna do this we're gonna figure it out like I have this thing where I I sometimes hold myself back thinking that I'm not the best at it mm -hmm. yet like I, I can't start or even when I go to interview somebody like oh well I don't know all there is to know about human trafficking so I like have that gives me a ton of anxiety I'll like research and study up always before like interviewing somebody such a I, such a specific yeah, well, that was just like the example of a. I was talking to Eliza Blue recently, and she was just on Tim Pool talking about this because she is heavily involved in the John Doe lawsuit on Twitter because they, uh, this was a big, um, it was in the news. Yeah, it came up a couple weeks ago. Basically, like Twitter's being sued because they didn't, they just uh, constantly fail to take down child porn. And, mm. uh, and, but this particular suit is, kind of blown up because they actually have them saying like it didn't violate our po our policies and uh twitter's just been like really really bad like just not even over the summer i think i like got into it with them like they don't take down their child porn obviously because somebody somewhere is profiting from it and i remember like wow. over the summer i was trying to take down some accounts uh and it sucks because it's like you're never i had never seen any any of that stuff like i'd gone my whole life without seeing any of it because you're like you know the average person thinks you know you have to go to like the depths of the dark web to see this shit and you're like oh no it's in your pocket it's on twitter it's literally right here yeah, and, yeah uh, I, I forgot who who said it but it's sort of um child pornography for normal people you know it's 
so far beyond what you would you know what you would imagine like i'm a i'm a i'm a dad and that mm. th the idea of that is just so fucking beyond me that it's almost like oh we can make some like jokes about it like right you, know, and, you almost and, like don't think it's real because exactly. it's just so like, horrible how can this be, yeah, yeah how can this be real um yeah that that's really that's really creepy and i think um uh, what's it a uh, i think Pornhub that there was like a write-up in the new york times about websites like like Pornhub yep. uh, having that that stuff as well revenge porn in particular you know these poor you know poor young you know teenage girls you know yeah getting their, the their Pornhub, stuff sent out. yeah Pornhub is also coming to grips with like finally being held accountable for stuff I think their big issue was like there was no way to verify like who you said you were in the account like they had a big problem with other people uh like uploading other folks's content and uh just the verification was like zero to none over there so i think they're starting to be held accountable like again i don't like know all there is to know but like it's very exciting to see this thing i was just talking to eliza about it in november and now you see oh wow it's like in the post so okay mm -hmm. things are starting to happen and uh so yeah i do get a lot of anxiety over like not knowing enough about the person I'm about to interview but then i just realized like okay, I just have to be, I just have to listen and be incredibly present and then listen for things like listen for what it sounds like this person has feelings about feels passionately for, or if there's like a nugget of like, oh, they're having a hard time talking about this, or this seems to bother them. And I'll be like, let's maybe I could try to like talk about that more with them. Mm -hmm. um, all the while I'm like taking notes, like I'm writing down like what we're talking about so I can type it up later and I can, you know, that way I don't have to listen to the whole thing over again. But yeah, it's like, it's a lot of work, but I feel like I'm at a point where, well, I have to keep it up because I have like the voice in my head that's like, don't be a slouch. Like, don't, you know, you've maintained like this level of output. Like, don't, it's like adding weights on when you're working out. You're like, yeah, the goal is to maintain this and then eventually go heavier. And, and you're, and you're also, you're not only accountable to yourself, but you're accountable to your fans now too. So that, so that's a big thing. So it's, it, it, it's great when, you know, you're putting all this work in and then you finally see people who are actually, you know, su supporting you and we're actually, you know, there every single time, you know, you go live or. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. It makes it so worth it, like to see the nice comments and like 90, yeah, 90 percent of the comments I'm seeing are all really nice and positive. And like when when someone gets something out of an interview where they like have a good takeaway because I've had this conversation like that makes it so worth it, like. I'm often up to like midnight, one, two, whatever, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., like uploading this stuff. So yeah, and that's that's always a good thing to remember, like when things feel like work, like, like why am I doing this? And then focus mm -hmm. on like, what is the joy you get out of anything that you're doing? Because that's always going to propel you to keep going or put in the extra hours or um, yeah, it's well, like not well, letting so, people down and, yeah. and wanting to like deliver a good product. Yeah, you know, uh you know, echo chambers get such a, such a bad rap. And, you know, in some instances I could, I could see that, but when you're a, you know, a personality and you sort of build uh, a community that can feel sometimes like a, like an echo chamber, it's like, well, I think you need it because I mean, you're definitely somebody you put stuff out there and you get, you get a lot of shit for it. And it's nice to be able to go back to, you know, the, the supporters, the tribe that, that, that you've, you know, sort of built to be like, Oh, you know what, for every one person who has a problem with what I'm doing, you know, there's 20 who are, you know, who are loving it. Yeah. And there's definitely, I think there's a difference between like an ego chamber and like a support group or a support system or like mm -hmm. a, a group of fans or a group of like, I don't know if you want to call them like, I don't know, influencers or personalities or, content makers that are like oh about this cause like for me like my squad it's like oh for anybody who's free speech so that should be that should be every comedian unfortunately it's not but it's like people who are energized to like whether it's because that's for me what made me like get political was like seeing free speech be fucked with and i was like oh no, no no we can't have this this is like a really horrible slippery slope and then i started to look at the rest of uh, like our rights that are that are kind of in danger right now. So that's what kind of propelled me into it. But it's it is nice, like starting to develop like a 
don't know if it's a fan base or a group or like, okay, like-minded people. And, and that doesn't mean that we're not opposed to hearing somebody on the other side. Like I definitely am. I feel like folks that are on like the other side are definitely opposed to a conversation with me. I, I feel like often it's like the middle or the right or libertarians that are more open and inclusive and down for conversation. And it's like the left and the alt left. That's like, no, no, we, we're not, you're the enemy. We're not going to have a conversation with you. Yeah. yeah the best is uh, when I meet people who are, you know, who are liberals and they're like, they're like, I don't know what the fuck is going on because I really like the stuff that you're doing, Lou. And I know that we disagree on a bunch of stuff, but I know that we can talk to each other. And that's, you know, it, usually it's, it's sort of like the same thing. And it's like, uh, and it's like, no, like you're my favorite people. Like you're basically like, like free speech people from the nineties. Um, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, we're kind of on the same, you know. Yeah. And I think that's good. I think that's progress when you can start to see like regular liberals peeling away from this because they're like, oh, we're not psychos. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, they're not about this hyper woke boat, you know? Um, it's just because that takes a lot and it's, there's very little wiggle room in there. So it's like, I think that's what's starting to happen. It's like you have, uh, groups like the walk away movement and, and others like it that are kind of, like all right you don't have to be uh that doesn't mean necessarily mean you have to now be a republican you have to now be identify as republican conservative or whatever it's just yeah we're just like shaking people off the tree a little bit like it, it's okay to mm -hmm. to not believe in this anymore because to believe in in everything they're offering the, the left is like kind of insane at this point and it's it's harder to be on board for all that craziness well, well i just read a uh um, an article that was published, I don't know if it was like the San Francisco Chronicle and it's, uh, a teacher published it. And it was about what Bernie Sanders was wearing at the inauguration and how the fact that this old guy from Vermont was wearing, uh, you know, a, I think it was like a, was it Barton or Burton jacket? And then like those mittens mm -hmm. that according to this author was a sign of his white privilege his class oh, privilege god. all this oh different oh my pudding. god he's an old man just let him wear it's also the same coat he wore he was photographed in like a few years ago so it's right like, people love to talk about that but you know what people don't love to talk about the fact that bernie was fucking robbed that the democrats like bought him out basically like that's people love to talk about outfits and memes and him sitting there with his arms folded it's so funny you know it's like yeah that's all distraction from like what really happened to poor bernie and like or talking about why his supporters are like so pissed off i don't know mm -hmm. it's all mirage well that well well yeah sometimes i um you know you wonder is it sort of the algorithm just feeds itself where it's like okay pay attention to this meaningless bullshit write up more stuff about this meaning meaningless bullshit and you know stay away from the hard stuff that 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 needs you know some real thinking and, and real conversations um you know i can't imagine i don't necessarily imagine that there's like a you know you know one person at the top saying do this uh post this post that this is going to do it but it's just it, the it orders just it, yeah. yeah the orders sort of trickle down and like the thing i've learned from the last definitely the last two years is um news doesn't just happen because like people think that news happens because things are going on it's it's kind of the other thing around like the powers that be want things to go on they want a perception so they create the news that supports what they want to have happen either in human consciousness or in terms of like how people are perceiving events to go down it's it's not the other way around it's like news is created to bury other news or news is created to bury like you know other stuff that maybe they don't want so much attention on. I remember I, I was at the the RNC back in in 2016, and um, uh, I, I want you know obviously uh, Alex Jones was there and he gave like a like a big speech, and when he was walking, uh, there were like more cameras following him and going off than there were actual like supporters around wow. him. So so you know so. I mean, if you're if if you're in there, you're like, oh my god, this is a huge crowd supporting you know supporting this guy, as opposed to it's like, well, you know, how much is not being seen because mm. we're only looking through you know these these little uh, yeah. the camera lens, you know. 
my experience was that he has a gigantic following because I was at, I was in DC at a rally in November, December, and January. I don't think, I don't think I saw Alex Jones there in January. I, I could be wrong. Maybe he was there. I just didn't see him. But I think I remember for December, like huge, he rolls with, he rolls so deep. There's such a huge crowd of like just bodyguards around him and just so many adoring fans and people who like believe in him. And then you also have, everyone's got a cell phone. Everybody's, you know, trying to cover him and I think at at one point like there were speakers going on and I think like Millie Weaver was on stage and uh from uh uh, from um Ruby Ridge is that the Millie Weaver I think used to be a reporter on um I don't know if it was oh then then it's probably not I can't remember the network she was from but I think maybe she used to work with Alex Jones and like, and then it, it was, it was nuts. It was it. His whole posse was following him up to the stage because he wanted to like get on stage and say something, but he wasn't a planned speaker. So his whole crowd is like this whole crowd around him was like, let him speak, let him speak. And he's trying to get through and they like wouldn't let him. And it was nuts. And then Alex kind of about face walked to like, I don't know, maybe 20 feet in the opposite direction. And he then brought with him not only his huge group of fans, but basically half of the group that was listening to like Millie, like the planned speech of this like planned rally. I don't know if it was like Stop the Steal or um, Million Maga March or whatever the name is. Of, you know, these events have different names. He had pulled away like half of the existing crowd to go follow him to listen to what he was speaking. So I know he's got like, he has, he has really a way with people and he's got a lot of like passionate, um, adoring fans. Mm-hmm. And when, uh, so, so one of the, the events that you were at recently, you were, um, you were at the Capitol, you were in DC when the, um, was it the, was it January 6th mm-hmm. when the, when the Capitol building was, um, quote unquote, uh, under siege oh yeah i'm a i'm an insurrectionist i'm a domestic terrorist oh yeah just because i happen to be in dc yeah yeah so so maybe we could we could talk a little bit about that and and what you saw because i I actually um full disclosure i i think i texted you and i was like uh be safe are you okay and you're like i'm (laughs) whoever whoever had your phone was like i'm okay (laughs) whoever had your phone i was like what do you want from aoc's desk i'm here no um (laughs) It was very, very chill. And like, that's it. That's what I want. Like most people to know, uh, like, I, th- I think most people just have the, what's well, the thing that's the power of the mainstream media is like, they basically tell people what they want people to think have happened. And that's what people believe instead of what actually happened. Um, so it was a planned two day event. There were, there was even a graphic that was going around, you know, there's all these different groups that are involved, but yeah, it's it's like decently organized. So there was like a a graphic going around. Okay. Like Tuesday night, we're meeting at freedom Plaza and these people are going to speak at like 9 PM. And then Wednesday morning, 9 AM, we're all going to meet at the ellipse or the, or the president's lawn, whatever it's called at 9 AM. And these people are going to speak. Uh, and then it was known that Trump was going to speak at noon, and then it was a planned marching point. Okay. And then 1 PM on Wednesday, we're all going to march to the Capitol. So that had been circulating for several days. It was a planned march point. So the fact that people ended up marching to the Capitol had nothing to do with anything that Trump had said prior or even like, you know, tweets or whatever. This wasn't like a sneaky, like plan as far as regular Patriots, regular people wanting to be there and, and express their first amendment. This wasn't like a sneaky plan to like, you know, you know, bust through the Capitol. It was just, we were going to walk there and stand in front of it and then go get dinner. Um, So uh, I remember he, Trump like started to speak a little bit later than planned. I think he started speaking. No, he was supposed supposed to start speaking at 11 actually. And he didn't really get up there till 12. And uh, so I remember around 1230, me and my friend, we were getting so cold because we had been standing there since 8 a.m. And, and she's like this little thing. She's like hummingbird. I was like, she's going to freeze to death. We got to start moving. We got to get the blood flow, flow going or else she's going to like be in bad shape. So we left at around 1230, 1240-ish, 1245 to march towards the Capitol. And a lot of other people were too because we knew, okay, that's the next march point. Um, so I'm taking videos, oh, marching to the Capitol, whatever. I tweet one out and it was hard to tweet because the Wi-Fi was so terrible. This is what happens when there's thousands of people around. Like I remember I'd even bought like a hotspot from from uh, Verizon, 
they were like, oh yeah, it's definitely going to work. I was like, really? With thousands of people around? I argue, sure. They're like, oh yeah, it's going to work. I bought it. The fucking thing didn't work at all. It pissed me off so much. I was like, God damn it. And uh, so I think maybe I had one tweet that was able to get out. Um, and I didn't, I just didn't realize, I, I don't know. I, I assume people are smarter, but I, I guess they're not, you know, I, I feel like a lot of folks are like brainwashed by the mainstream media. So they don't, most people, I guess, didn't know this was a regular March. This was a planned March point that there even was a planned peaceful March for January 6th or whatever. So I guess like this Booker girl got a hold of my tweet, retweeted it saying, I don't know about LA comics, but here in New York, our comics are storming the Capitol. And then anybody who like doesn't like me or is jealous mm. or whatever, like, oh, they see this girl. This girl used to book comedy shows and maybe she'll book them again, like in two years if we kiss her ass, you know? So everybody's like meeting her up here. All oh, There was like this day of people shitting on me for being in DC, like calling me an insurrectionist. And like, meanwhile, I was never in the building. I just was there literally and, and if you were new- i wouldn't say anything <laughs> I, I would not i would not. was there as a neutral like yeah i'm not like with a news place but i do a podcast and it's i feel like it was my responsibility to report on what was happening uh yeah of course of course i'm also there for like a comedy aspect i'm going to interview funny people weird people i'm going to take pictures of funny signs people's funny costumes like i love all that shit um so, but I'm kind of there in like a neutral observer kind of way. I'm not like decked out in MAGA gear. So, and then you have people, you know, like comics and people, of course, all these people don't know me. These are people that like, I haven't seen in years uh, or whatever it is, it's, you know, leave it to people who don't really know you or haven't seen you in years to be like the expert on who you are. So all these comments are like, oh, like she's taking a dark turn or like I knew her 10 years ago. I can't believe the direction she's going in. Uh, oh, oh, oh like, can I, can I, can I, um, can I just share with you a dark yes, turn, a dark please. turn that I took? Okay. So, so um, it was back when you remember the, um, the Covington high school kid, um, mm-hmm. Nick, Nicholas Sandman, he was yeah. wearing a MAGA hat and he, w- he was accosted by a, uh, uh, a native American elder. Right. Oh, right. I remember that. Yeah. And um, so I had I had posted something because it, it, originally the story was that, you know, this kid had got into hit into the old man's face and was yeah. very disrespectful and everyone to everybody wanted to punch, you know, that kid's smirking mouth. Mm-hmm. And um, I and when when the truth came out and, and that that wasn't that didn't happen, I said I posted something basically saying, look, even if that had happened the way that the mainstream had said it had gone down, I, I'm I, I'm not about jumping on a young kid's life to you know basically ruin him forever. Um, but uh, but also uh, everyone should know that that guy, that old man who did that, is a piece of shit. Um, and and this dude said, yeah, man, I watched the uh, I watched the you know the full video. And you're going down to some dark roads, brother. <laughs> some dark, and I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, dark God. roads by by Relax. yeah. By saying, hey, you know, by pointing out this is this is what actually happened. Why are you saying that it's not, or or finding a way to just uh, you know to justify it, you know, so it fits anybody's uh, narrative? But I'm sorry, you said dark. It was dark exactly. Place. It's there. exactly what you're saying. People started to say this when I started to do shows on Compound Media, when I pitched and got my own show on Compound Media. Oh, like people are very, very concerned. I'm doing so well without following the liberal like comedian path, you know, like, oh, I think your concern is actually just jealousy, but you're trying to seem like holier than thou. So you're going to say it's concern because if you were really concerned, you would have messaged me privately instead of gossiping <laughs> publicly on Twitter. You know, so- that, that that's such a huge thing that that really is such a such a huge part. And, and I've done that a, a number of times where I've. Um, someone has posted something uh, uh, publicly and I'll hit them up and be like, Hey, you know, uh, I know you and you know me. And we, I thought we had like a good relationship, a good rapport. So that's why I'm, I'm messaging you directly to say like, what, you know, what, what's going on here? Um, because the worst thing I, I mean, I mean, if you, if you, if I were to post something about somebody publicly and I'm wrong about it, I would just feel so, so bad about getting it wrong. And then, and then just even, you know, afterward, just thinking, oh, man, why did I uh, was I willing to, you know, take somebody down for, you know, 
they need a yeah i don't even think these people care about being right i think they care about like jumping on a bandwagon they're literally just thinking with what can i say that will get me attention in this moment what can i say now that will get me liked by the right people because they don't care about Mm. me i can't give them anything like uh they were they wouldn't dare say anything like this like (laughs) while i was a producing a show at the Stonewall Inn that maybe they could get on because that was a really great show uh, that I hosted for six years. But as soon as I don't have anything to offer these people, oh, now it's like I'm, I have this huge target on my back. I'm like so dangerous. I need to be taken was that, down. Was that in the cabaret? In the cabaret? Uh, yeah, theater? it was upstairs. Yeah. yeah I did it was a, great. I, I had the time of my life. It's beautiful. Yeah. There. yeah oh, it's, it's really so nice. great. I, I like, I was so proud of that show. I was, I put so much of my own money into advertising, really grew it. It's like, it's like it's a big deal to have a show in the city at a bar for a year but six years it's like i put up with so much shit from the Mm. owner of that club moving the show last minute it's just so and because the guy didn't really care about comedy it's like i get it it's a landmark they care more just about like filling the room and which i was doing but you know he would he had no qualms with being like oh yeah we got to move you we have an urgent like madonna sing along and i'd be like okay this is the (laughs) deal with this place you know like they're not they don't really care about comedy um so I, you know, I really bent over backwards a lot to keep that show going. People don't know about that stuff. People don't care. They just think, oh, well, you're not like woke anymore and you're not in a position to book me on something. So I have no problem talking shit. Um, so a lot of that. And it's like, it's fine. It's like, I'm, and I'm no stranger to this stuff. This happens every, every so often. I, I think it just gives me like a thicker skin. It's like, I just quietly make note of these people and it's like, all right, if I'm in a position to help or give spots or I have a show or a production company or whatever, I'll just quietly make note of these people. And I just won't help them out because mm-hmm. there's plenty of people who are loyal and have my back and aren't full of shit. So, uh, it's like no real loss for me. It's just, it's just sad to be like, Oh, this is the links that you'll go to, to impress other people that you think will help you out or give you a, a bar spot, you know, in two years when things aren't normal. So, yeah. And, and you would think, man, I you would think that, you know, people like that would, would kind of look around and, and check out their resume and be like, Hmm, has this tactic worked for me yet? Like how mm. many shows have I booked just by, I don't know, jumping on the bandwagon and, you know. Yeah. Because the comedy scene is like high school. Like people aren't, they just want to feel like they belong. I think a lot of people are not actually looking at their careers or their brands or like really trying to build an audience. They just want to like feel cool, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing, but I just, I don't want to be a part of that. Or, you know, those people are showing me that they're not someone you want to work with in the future. So Mm -hmm. it's all good. And uh, I just was like, oh, wow, this is just shit on Chrissy Mayer day. It was amazing. And it was amazing to me seeing like people who wouldn't even like write out my name. They would like use emojis with my name, I guess. So I couldn't find the tweet on Twitter. I guess. Yeah, I never get that. I don't understand that at all. Like you're afraid to write my name out. Like, what am I like (laughs) Snape or something from Harry Potter? (laughs) Uh, So it's just weird. It's like, if you're going to talk shit, talk shit, tag me. Here we go. And then, you know, even people I'd be like, hey, I'm here. If you're really concerned, I'm here. My DMs are open for you. But I know you won't DM me because I know you're full of shit. And then like I'd sit and I'd wait. And of course, these people would not reach out directly, which kind of tells you all you need to know. Um, But that's that's how it is, you know. So we went from oh, so Stonewall some years back, and now we're at the Capitol, and you're you're oh yeah you're you're, you're sending stuff out and um yeah the tweets weren't really going out I just was getting a lot of videos taking taking a lot of photos um so we all get there at the Capitol it's like uh I mean there had to have been at least five hundred thousand probably more people there it just it was really? way wow. more that it was it could have been it could have been a million like honestly there i heard there was like 1.5 million at the like the million maga march which is in november december i think was a little bit worse organized but there was uh, so many people in uh january 6th i think more than that first march in november just like as far as the eye can see like just so many people and uh so we get to the capitol we kind of were hanging back away i was on the north side of the building by where there was like a little bit of a pond and i and you know we saw like a couple of flashbangs go off but not, nobody was like running away from it and i was like huh what is that what was that you know and then we see tons of old people families kids there everyone's just walking straight up to the building like it's central park like it's like it's like it's a 
Universal Studios. Like there were no cops around. People were just walking around very chill, peaceful, almost like a Woodstock vibe, you know, like everyone's just there with their signs and some people have music and some people, a lot of people had dogs. I was very interested in meeting all the dogs, taking pictures <laughs> of the dogs. That's like another thing I like to go to these rallies for is just pet all the dogs. <laughs> So we're walking up and everyone's walking up like right just up against the building. And then you see the classic, you know, people climbing up the fence, like they're on the wall, you know, the, the stone wall and people were up on the scaffolding. They did a big flag drop down the side of the scaffolding that they were, I think they had some construction going on in anticipation for the inauguration. So it was like very chill. There was like nothing being destroyed that I could see. Like from what I was seeing, it, it just looked like people were climbing up the building to just wave from the building. Like, I didn't know people were like really breaking into where the hearings were going on mm. until I didn't put that together till like much later after we got back to our hotel, I was like, Oh wow. And then you talk to other people that were like, yeah, I was around the other corner. We saw somebody with wire cutters. We saw somebody with a sledgehammer. I'm like, okay, normal people don't bring these items to a regular rally. So that's when I, it's, I started to put some things together. Like, okay, this, this is, this is looking like a false flag. This is looking like, you know, something that like, okay, that plus the real lack of any kind of police presence makes this look kind of like a setup to make the right look bad. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you put that juxtaposed all the, the craziness from the summer the everything that was being destroyed, set on fire, businesses being, you know, torched, police precincts being broken into people dying. So it's, uh, um uh yeah I, I remember you know seeing seeing footage and um that like, like sort of like footage that that you described of you know just a lot of people around but then seeing uh other footage of just like fucking mayhem like, of inside you know, the building yeah, yeah. yeah inside or you know people you know people trying to get into it which was never a good idea you know that that just um that just was a recipe for uh for disaster but but it is interesting to see the um you know the response to that versus the response to you know the riots and arsons um that that were happening you know over yeah. the summer you know and it's very hypocritical the way even people being inside the building like two years ago i think i don't know if it was me too or the kavanaugh hearings or something there was something where like it was on the it was like you know they had either me too women coming in or whatever it is like they had people coming into the capitol building like welcome welcome to them in you know and pelosi described it as oh these are people that are taking part in democracy like they you know, they probably just walked in much like people just walked in on January 6th, but oh, when it's on the left, it's okay. It's participating in democracy. When someone on the right does it, it's an insurrection. So, and there's, it's, it's very hypocritical. Yeah. The whole insurrection um, uh, label, uh, I, I said, wow, you know, for, uh, for Americans to try to attempt an insurrection without guns, that just doesn't seem very... <laughs> Doesn't yeah, seem very especially American. when these are all the people who have the guns, you know, if they right. wanted to like shoot up the place or really take it over, they could have. And, and I guess easily, but they didn't do that. I think that people showed like amazing restraint. Well, it seemed, and, you know, obviously that there, there were, you know, pe people who died and that was, you know, terrible to, um, you know, to hear about that. There was the, the one uh, woman who was, who was shot and there was uh, the police officer that, that, that died later on. Um, there was just so it, it, it was, it was so weird to to be seeing it to, to watching from the outside because you had so many people just openly taking selfies and filming themselves and it's like uh it's like i wonder how much of it was done how much of the participation was sort of like oh shit i could i can get in there right now well let kind me go of. in and run around right if you're scared for your life or or if you are 100 percent focused on taking something over you're not going to have the mind of like oh, oh my god i'm going to take a picture on this desk you know what i mean like that's you're, that's like playing around like if you're really serious about an insurrection you're not going to be in the mindset of like taking photos and having fun and like to holding a, a podium up so that's what makes me think like okay like there are people that went in there kind of maybe just to have fun take pictures and then there was like this other group that, who knows who they were in relation with uh went into like actually fuck shit up and you know cause some problems yeah i wonder uh 
that, you know, as people are, are tracked down and, and, you know, found out, I wonder, you know, what's going to come of that. Cause apparently one of the, I remember reading about one of the guys, like, where did he get the, uh, the, the ties, you know, the plastic ties like that, like, you oh, know, came yeah. um, but it turns out that guy had picked it up off of a, a desk uh, that was like a, um, a capital uh, policeman's. Okay. Thing, right. So sense. it's like, it's like, yeah. okay, cool. So at least with that individual, there wasn't, you know, forethought, you know, that he was going to go and, and, and really oh, yeah. it over. Yeah. I don't think anybody was in there like, let's take hostages. I think people are like upset about the election and wanted their voices heard. So today I, I put out a, a, a call for, uh, for questions for, uh, for Chrissy Mayer and, uh, we're going to get to those right now. So if you want to hear these, uh, head over to locals or, Ooh. I mean, if, or if they're so awesome, I don't know, maybe I'll just give them to you guys. We'll oh see. Oh my gosh. Wow. I, might have, I might have to have to edit out this whole thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. So the, the first one, I think this is a, this is a good question. Uh, will comedy thrive or suffer under the Biden administration? Ooh, um, yes, because I think the people that are actually really trying to do comedy, with all these challenges are going to like are going to like persevere and and they're going to win ultimately because if you i mean with all these challenges like a lot of the places shut down and weird social distancing rules you're dealing with venues who may or may not be paranoid about the virus it's like there are a lot of challenges and i think the people who who ultimately push through that are going to be are meant to do it and they're not and they're not going to let anything stop them so anything so if anything i think this is a time that kind of separates like the men from the boys in terms of like who's really wanting to do comedy as their passion as their purpose in life and who maybe weren't so serious about it and yeah i think there's an overall kind of waking up of of human consciousness right now and a lot of people are starting to see like the way we've been lied to over the years and what the realities are about our government um and like kind of of it all i think that will be something that like we can we can eventually joke about and like you know as more and more becomes unveiled that becomes part of like our shared human reality and then anytime there's a shared reality you can make fun of that and create comedy from it yeah and i i think that uh with comedy especially when it comes to like doing political comedy or or satire or making fun of culture um you know hypocrisy is just it, it, it's just infinite, you know, the amount of material, uh, source material that you can have. And the fact that, you know, for what going on, you know, maybe close to 20 years, people now have like a backlog of every single thing that they've said on social media, you know, you could kind of <laughs> pick apart like, oh, well, but you said this and now uh, you're saying right. this. So what does, but I wonder if we're beyond like hypocrisy at some point where even if you are making fun of it, uh, people just don't necessarily give a shit. <laughs> like they're just going to own what, whatever they believe now or whatever they're I think so. to believe now. Yeah. Nobody wants to be told they're wrong or they're dumb. And it's, so that's what the big, that's the most frustrating part of it of like kind of the more truth, you know, the more truth you want to spread and you want to like wake people up. You can't force that process. You just have to like get them to start asking questions and then they kind of have to seek it out on their own and kind of do their own research and like in order to do your own research you have to be curious about it your mind has to be open to it you can't like force anybody's mind open how do you um i have the, i i have an issue where i'm like how do i keep myself in check like as far as like going down like rabbit holes or um believing this source versus that source like how do you how do you go about about doing that because i mean you, you put out so much material you do you know so many interviews with uh with people with all you know all different kinds of uh, theories or insights about what's going on. Like, how do you pick and choose? Like, oh, you know what? I think that is bullshit. I think this mm -hmm. is uh, is legit. It is. It is hard to, especially when like you have people that are like, "This is what's going to happen," or they, they you they get you excited for certain certain things to happen on certain dates. Like for me, I just I try to take in as much as I can. Like I try to absorb as much as I can. I try to read as much as I can. And then like don't try not to form an opinion right away. Like if someone says something and you're like, oh I'm getting excited about this. I have hope that XYZ event. It's like, okay, like just like put it away. You know what I mean? Like does that affect your day to day? Probably not. Um, so I would just, cause I think a lot of us are tired of like being hopeful for things to happen and then they don't. So 
don't leave it to one person to like save you just every day, wake up, be like, all right, how can I get myself in a good mood? How can I uplift myself and those around me? How can I do what I love? Um, you know, whatever it is, how can I make money? Like just focus on your, on taking care of you and your people and like feeling good. And, uh, that, that I think that should be everybody's priority and just like thinking good thoughts and like praying and manifesting and like creating and, and trying not to like, you know, everyone gets depressed and feels sad, but trying to not like stay down there for too long. Uh, how did, how did you start, uh, you know, get into, you know, basically uh, befriending and doing a lot of interviews and stuff with, uh, with porn stars? Like how did, how did that come about? It's- started when I did you manifest uh, that oh yeah I manifested (laughs) all that ass when I started wet spot I was very inspired by early Howard Stern and how they would have like porn stars doing fun remote segments in studio so and I've also always felt like kind of a kinship with porn stars because they like comics are sort of have the black mark on them and they're rejects of society and they're similarly like not taken seriously as we comics are so i've always felt like a like kind of a bond there i mean plus like plus they're fun everyone likes to see boobs compound Mm -hmm. media has like a largely male subscriber base so to me that all added up to like a winning combination um just to have a fun and it's like a sex dating relationship themed advice show so it's like you know they are kind of like experts in a way you know So, and then plus like, they're just fun. And especially when you get one that's like funny and can keep up with like the sense of humor of a comic, um, it's just like a jackpot win-win, but not everybody like loves porn stars. Some people are just like very judgy of them. Some people are just like sick of them. So it's like, you're not going to make everybody happy. But for me, I think they add like a fun little like element to the show. Are are there any uh, like sort of, uh, are there any porn stars where the, sort of like the uh, the Chrissy Mayer of porn in that like they they take on controversial subjects and like get uh, get pushback for it. Uh, there's like actually that? like two answers for this. There is a girl who people there are some people who think that I have done porn like they actually it's actually a picture of Lauren Phillips, who is another redhead. She's got a big like tattoo on the side of her I'm body. Not gonna it's look, like, I'm not going to look go- her up. If you Google my mm. name, like the, there'll be Phillips. a split. There's a there's an image of like me on one side, her on the other. And like, she's in the middle of a porn. It's just like me with like my shirt up. Like I'm just sort of like making fun of my belly or something. Uh, and someone actually like airbrushed her tattoo onto the side of me to make oh, that's oh, Christy awesome. Mirror does porn. Yeah, you can tell I have the same tattoo. And I was like, oh God, that's funny. Um, but in terms of like being awake and like uh, going against the status quo and like talking about like rabbit hole stuff and some truth, uh, Karma RX is really great. Um, Brandy Love is is pretty awake, talking about a lot of stuff. So uh, it is, Ran- is awake. James. It is awake the opposite of woke. It is, is that- yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you're learning real truths about the world, and it's not just like woke. To me, is a it's like it's acting. That's like a, being woke is like being a performance. Like who is this for? Who are you trying to impress? Like, um, not so wrapped up in identity politics. Um, so yeah, I would say Karma RX. Brandy Love, Randy James, a little bit Jaden Cole too. So just basically anybody I'm like, <laughs> I like or I'm like friends with is probably knows what's up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I mean, I grew up as a, you know, as a, as a kid, I had like the Spice Channel, you know, so I was able to, to see like, uh, you know, those porn stars. So uh, when I look back, I'm like, wow, you know, the, the porn stars from my, from my heyday you know, I always like looked up to them as like, you know, these perfect women that I would never, I, I don't know, I looked up to them in a different, uh, in a different way where I feel like now it, there's just so much porn, anybody can be a porn star. And, and it's, and, and, and look, you know, there's, there's something, you know, uh, democratic about that, you know, anybody can go and do it. Um, but I, but I, I've definitely heard people say that it's lost a lot of its allure. Yeah, well, think about it when, like, when porn came out, it's like, it wasn't, not everyone had a phone. Not everybody had it in their pockets. It would come out like first it was magazines and it was like, oh, wow, a centerfold. And then it was like, oh, wow, on my dial up. Like I'm seeing, you know what I mean? Like a nude <laughs> right. image is slowly starting to come in. And then it was like, yeah, then it was like, then you could watch videos on your computer. Oh, and then we had cell phones and now you can look at porn literally 24 hours a day. So 
I don't know if it's like, yes, more people are doing it, but it's also just in, in more places and it's way more accessible. So it could just be like maybe collective burnout mm -hmm. too. And I know there, there are quite a few performers who are having a tough time making a living. And I know there's a, uh, there was a write up in the New York times about um, uh, women on only fans who just are not, are not scraping by. And it's like, uh, it's like, well, how, <laughs> how do you compete? See, you uh, have to have multiple streams of income. You can't just do OnlyFans. You got to do other stuff too. Just like with just anybody with an entrepreneurial spirit, just like a comedian. Like you can't just rely on clubs. You got to, you know, maybe you got to do a podcast. Maybe you got to get sponsors. Maybe you got to like do like a locals or Rockfin or whatever. So I think the same applies to like the uh, sex industry too. Mm -hmm. Right on. Chrissy Mayer. Thank you so much. And uh, one more time, uh, the dates where you're going to be performing in uh, mid-February. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, February 6th, this Saturday, I'm going to be at Cost Cobb. So uh, just go on to Eventbrite and look up Cost Cobb Comedy for tickets there. February 19th and 20th, I'll be at Hyenas in Dallas. February 26th, I'll be with the Comedians of the Compound in Royersford, Pennsylvania at Soul Joel's Comedy Club. And then on February 28th, I believe it's a Sunday. I'll be headlining the Stress Factory in New Brunswick, New Jersey. So go to my website for tickets for all those shows, chrissymayer.com. Check out the Chrissy Mayer podcast Tuesday through Fridays on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and the Wet Spot on Compound Media, Mondays at 7.30, uh, compoundmedia.com. Awesome. Chrissy, thank you so much. Thanks, I'm going to stop recording right now.